Today's walk down memory lane features this working 100-year-old Victrola. This was by far their most popular model, although between 1901 and the late 1920s, the Victor Talking Machine Company sold over 8 million Victrolas. It's estimated that there are about 600,000 of them still in existence today, so this unit is old, but not especially rare. It was purchased on New Year's Eve on 19, in 1918 in Baltimore, Maryland. Here's a copy of the receipt. It cost $100. That was a lot of money back then, equal to about $1,662 of today's dollars. The advent or onset of electronic amplification hastened the Victrola's demise. That was in the late 1920s. And then the onset of the Great Depression was really the final nail in the coffin. Here's how it works. The turntable is powered by a spring, which is wound up by this crank on the side of the unit. turntable is engaged by releasing the turntable brake here and once it spins up to 78 rpm you can gently lower the arm onto the record like so there's no record there right now but there will be in a minute the tone arm and sound box amplify the vibrations of the steel needle in the groove of the shellac record. The sound is carried through a cast iron horn underneath the turntable and protects, projects out the front of the unit, which is right here. And so the volume can be adjusted by opening or closing these top doors. The bottom area is not really functional, but is used to store additional records. So that's stored space, basically. In order to uh, ensure good con contact with the groove, the needle and its assembly have a tracking force of 115 grams, about the weight of a stick of butter. Due to this high weight, the steel needle is replaced each time a record is played. Fortunately, the original owner left a little tin of needles um, which you can use each time you want to play a record. By comparison, the tone arm on the turntable I had in college had a tracking force of one gram, about the weight of an M&M. I replaced the diamond tip stylus yearly. Being a mechanical device, the Victrola was designed to be maintained. Getting to the motor is pretty straightforward. Let's take a look under the hood. The first thing is to unscrew the arm that cranks up the spring by turning it counterclockwise until it comes off. Then the turntable lifts right off. And a couple of screws allow you to remove the turntable brake mechanism. The motor board is held down by two screws at the front of the unit. And once they're removed, the entire thing can flip up. And there's even a thoughtful hold up uh, lever to keep it all in place. So what to play? When I was a wee lad, my parents took the family on vacation, and while we were there, we saw the 1958 film version of the musical South Pacific. I loved it. When we got home, my parents made the mistake of telling me that they had the 1949 Broadway soundtrack on 78s. So I would proceed to load up the changer and play them over and over and over again, as my siblings can attest. So here is the original 1949 recording, it's on seven platters, 
18 songs in all, mostly one or two songs on a side. Interestingly, the cover art was created by a guy named Alex Steinweiss, who is considered by many to be the father of album cover art. Before he arrived on the scene, record albums were typically just sold in plain brown wrappers, so there was nothing unique or uh, particularly creative about them. So the piece I've chosen to play is from the 1949 soundtrack, Twin Soliloquies by Mary Martin and Ezio Pinza. And I think you'll agree that um, although the sound is not up to today's standards for a 70 year old record and a 100 year old record player, it's still pretty good. So let's fire it up and see how it goes. Like a schoolboy, what will be your answer? 